No. Let's get it going. Let's get it going. <laughs> this is Brad from TRT for Warriors. I am here with uh, Dr. Dean St. Mark. Um, what do you, by the way, what do you go by? What, should I call you Dr. What, uh, Dean? D- just no, Dean. D- Dean's perfect for the conversation. I I, uh, <laughs> I always laugh at when, when Dr. Dean comes out. I know I'm in trouble because my, <laughs> my, my my mother says Dr. Dean. <laughs> so now you, you, you have your PhD. Did you end up getting a medical doctorate or anything like that on top of things? No, no, I never moved into medicine, but I did do like continuous professional development into um, functional medicine, and that's sort of where. Oh, wow. You know, a lot yeah. my a lot of my a lot of my philosophies come from when it comes to pharmacology, which you've probably seen online in various places. Yeah. So, I am um, so like for me, like where you stand out, and where like I really so I was doing like research on testosterone dosing and like this the safe parts of anabolics and that sort of thing. And you came up, and you were on a podcast, and you had talked about. Um, CYP450 enzymes, which I want to get into later. But what's yep. your origin story? Like, how did you get into this? And and uh, what's your kind of current career? So, like you said, my name is Dr. Dean St. Mart. I have a first class honors degree in chemistry and pharmaceutical chemistry. So it was a double degree. And that, that primarily focused on um, drug development and drug design. And then from there, I... I won scholarships to go do a PhD and that, that PhD was in synthetic organic chemistry. Originally, um, I did want to be a medical doctor, yeah. but um, halfway through high school or our secondary school system, I, I was just a little lost with how, uh, looking at how medicine was as an overall and sort of looking at that as a long-term career, it, it didn't really appeal to me anymore when I was starting to turn, you know, 16, 17 and looking, yeah. you know, 20, 30 years down the line. Do you guys have a national health service in Ireland? We do. Yes. Yes. Okay. We, we have a, a public health service. And then What's I, the I the live, the uh, HSC is the, HSC. the public. So the HSC is the, the public health service for Ireland. And then I live in Northern Ireland, which is technically the, the UK or England. Oh, Okay. And, oh, wow. and we okay. also we also have the NHS. So I'm originally from Dublin, which is the capital of Ireland. And then seven years ago, I moved three hours north to Tyrone. So oh. we literally live we literally live on the border between north and south. So five minute drive, and you're back into Republic of Ireland. So so do you wait? So that's interesting. So you would be a citizen of the UK then? I technically am, yeah, as well as... Now that just blew my mind, uh, by the way. I totally yeah, yeah. forgot this even exists, so interesting. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So literally, like, I, I... So here we use UK sterling, and then literally if I go five minutes across the bridge to get petrol for my car, I can pay in euro because I'm technically back in Ireland again. Oh, wow. So okay. it's, 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 it's an the interesting... The complexities of this and also in medicine, uh, yeah. too, and how it changes, <laughs> like, you know, what you would do for, you know, like your career, that sort of thing changes tremendously just by crossing the border, right? It it does, yeah. And I mean, it's a a funny scenario there because the English Health Service is the NHS, so the National Health Service, and the NHS is radically different to the Irish Health Service. Oh, really? I'm I'm more so, because I'm an Irish citizen, it's a little more difficult for me to register on the NHS. Oh, really? <laughs> so I'm still registered with the HSC. Well, you guys weren't Europeans up until, uh, what, the, the 1900s? <laughs> yeah. so, I'm Welsh and, I, and, uh, and half Sicilian, so I'm a total mutant uh, in this. And, like, I'm not anything to the, you know, to the, to the UK. <laughs> I mean, they see me as a sort of mutt, right? So. <laughs> so, like, if I'm sick, I can't see a doctor in our local area because I'm not registered on the NHS. Oh, and then... Wow. Like I said, five minutes across the bridge is Donegal, which is part of the Republic of Ireland. The The doctor won't see me there because I don't have an address in Donegal. <laughs> so, like I said, I grew up in Dublin, so my GP is three hours away. So if I'm ever sick, I have oh, to wow. drive three hours to my parents to see my <laughs> no. my old doctor. And, and this is as crazy as it is, right? Because at one time I was badly sick and i'm very hesitant to go down the route of seeing a doctor unless i i know i need to yeah and well you're too dangerous for your own good like, you yeah yourself, right? so. yeah <laughs> and i remember phoning up the the out of hours clinic in donegal 
And he said to me, what's your address? So I gave them my address here, which is technically the UK. Yeah. I said, oh, well, you don't live in Donegal. I said, no, but I am badly sick. And the difference between the NHS and the HSC of Ireland is in the NHS, you have free health care. So when you go see a GP, you oh, don't pay, okay. you don't pay anything. Everything is, everything is publicly funded and covered. Whereas in Ireland, it's semi-privatized. So you do have to pay your GP when you go to okay, see him. Okay. So there is a, a 50 euro or 60 euro charge it works out maybe like 50 or $45 or something like that to see your doctor. And I remember saying to the receptionist on the phone, you do realize I'm going to pay your doctor to see him. Like, it's not free. Like, I don't know why you're yeah. denying me from seeing a doctor. <laughs> you're going to be getting money from me. Yeah. <laughs> and eventually I convinced her. She said, okay, I've got, a, I've, got an op- I've got a, I've got an opening in 15 minutes if you can make your way over. But literally, like, because I had no address in Donegal, they wouldn't see me and i'm offering to pay them the money like i need to see a doctor i will pay i will pay to see the doctor (laughs) interesting and it's obviously a radical shift right because you know you're saying that you kind of went into um you know before we you know started recording that you you know you got your degree and then you um instead of going the medical the doctored route right you, you you go into this engineering and and d- drug design type of thing which is a totally different side of a career where in reality actually you can help a lot more people than you would say just being a medical doctor yeah i mean even even as it got closer to the end of my phd even the, the appeal of of going into an, another medical field or something like that it, i became disillusioned that even the model of how medicine is approached in the Ah, yeah. Even even from a drug development perspective, we aim to design drugs that treat symptoms as opposed to the, the root cause of the disease. And I mean, it, it's always like a light bulb moment when you explain this to someone and you go, yeah. Jesus, I never really thought about that. Like the, the leading medications for blood pressure and um, dyslipidemia for, you know, cardiovascular disease, they all aim to lower cholesterol or lower your blood pressure but you never actually go after what's causing the disease in the first place and i just oh interesting okay. this sort i've always of been joking about why we don't have a you know bpc 157 peptide with <laughs> some zinc and let's throw in you know let's throw in some garlic uh whatever extract stuff that kills stuff and uh you know something else right and you would have like a you know a one pill that would do something and it yeah. would work Right. I mean, that's so uh, I guess an aside. So obviously, after my, my PhD, I moved into chemical engineering. I, I got away from. Oh, really? <laughs> I got away from I got away from uh, drug design and so going polymers down route, so. and glass and just making industrial chemicals, so, basically. No. So chemical engineering, my, my role within Intel is within their uh, dry etch plasma department. So basically using a uh, high pressure gas to create a plasma that's used to then um, etch or embed the silicon wafer that, that a, a computer chip ends up as. Oh, so, okay. so it's a completely change of career. <laughs> Mainly. I, you know, I like read it on your LinkedIn. I didn't know what that meant at all. Yeah. I knew, I knew it did something, <laughs> but I didn't understand what the context was. So, was so mainly, it. mainly mechanical engineering. And then obviously the, the, the chemistry side comes into it on how we, you know, create plasma because plasma is a, a fort, state of matter and and it's basically a high pressured ionized gas so that that was intriguing to me moving into that rather than pure benchtop chemical synthesis wow and then obviously like probably what sparked your interest as an aside just for pure entertainment and obviously i i'm a bodybuilder myself uh, and i was originally then a kickboxer that sort of led me into bodybuilding Oh, good thing um, you got into bodybuilding. You, you walk away from <laughs> kickboxing. I had a quite a bad injury to my right ankle, uh, so I smashed some of the bones in my right ankle in a training session. Um, now I, I did. Funny enough, I, I won the world championships in two thousand and ten. Oh, shit. after after the injury, and then after that, I, I sort of I left my kickboxing days behind. And oh, good thing you did. I mean, you know, <laughs> thing, the more we learn, so yeah, I'm focused entirely on traumatic brain injury. And, you know, TRT and hormone optimization just happens to come with that. But yep. if you get into boxing, NFL, kickboxing, 
you're just inducing traumatic brain injury on a daily basis. Like it's not yeah. even a question of, Oh, you can have it. It's no, you have it. Like once you yeah. play the sport, you hit your head once you're, you're inducing traumatic brain injury. So it's like, uh, yeah. I find it interesting that, you know, there's a lot of people who are kind of coming out of these contact sports and either getting out early or through injury, having to get out and then having to play catch up with their injuries. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I left in, in 2000 and 2010. So I, I was, 22 oh, and, Lord. Uh, <laughs> and that, that injury that happened to my ankle when it did happen um the surgeon at the time the orthopedic surgeon did say to me oh you'll never kick box again and me being quite a stubborn driven individual said yeah. oh i'll show i'll show you <laughs> <laughs> and that was that was what those 2008 when it happened so two years later as at the world championships but um after that i knew the longevity of my ankle if i kept going you know, it, it's more important to me to be able to walk in my forties and fifties <laughs> yeah. than than having a, an an ankle. Because literally, the injury that did happen, I was walking around for about three months after the injury, thinking that it was just a badly sprained, oh, you know, ligament. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, I always tell the story as something that you just have this gut instinct because I remember at the time that the orthopedic surgeon was like, "Oh, we'll just get an MRI done and we'll." Because obviously I was having failed physio and I said to him, you know, let, let's let's actually just go in and do surgery. Go in with a, an orthoscopic, you know, go in with a scope, see what's going on in the ankle. And if needed, you know, correct whatever's gone wrong. And he said, yeah. well, I prefer we get an MRI for I said, well, if that's what you want to do. But I said to him, I'd like you to go in and look at what's <laughs> going on with my ankle. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> Anyway, we got the MRI done and then the surgery, the, the investigative surgery was booked, say, for 10 days later. And it, this always, uh, like, shocks me that after the surgery, he, he brought me into the office and he showed me pictures of the damage around my ankle. It was quite a, a large bone spur and that there was a big chunk of cartilage off the bottom of my tibia. Um, generally just a mess of just floating bits of bone fragment and and cartilage and it, then he took out the MRI and put it up on a screen and he said see that MRI he goes only for there's a, a mild hairline fracture up up the back of your tibia I would have yeah. sent you away I, I would have sent you away and you know then he's then he takes out the photos from the, the scope and from the surgery said uh, yeah when I went in to do the investigative surgery he said it was a mess oh no so he said it goes to show even some of the, the top investigative procedures don't really end up finding anything you know and the I, same I, thing that happened with me with my brain i talked to a brain surgeon and he's like well we know that when you have a tbi you know you're going to hit on the pituitary and the hypothalamus you're going to degradate you know that tissue you're going to have micro tears yeah. and i was like well so what can you do about it he's like we can't do anything i was like <laughs> yeah. well then why am i seeing you what, what's the point of me seeing a spine <laughs> surgeon you know a, a, a brain surgeon you cost like you know, a million dollars a year for your salary and, you know, billions of dollars in medical equipment and supplies. Like, come on, dude. Like, why am yeah. I even here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, he, he then like the afterwards, he said, obviously it was a good job. He did push for the, the investigative surgery, but afterwards he said, like, there was quite a lot of damage there to the, to the end of the bone that, you know, it would be wise to lay off non-contact sports. But wow. I mean, I, I, after that, I had extensive physio, I pretty much had to relearn how to walk again, but oh, damn. There, there, there came a point where the physiotherapist I was working with, Dan, I think his name was, he, he was really, um, he was really encouraged of, of getting back to, to what I was doing previously as well. That, you know, once I was able to maintain like a, a nice jog, then we pushed more towards a sprint. And then once I could sprint on it, he took me over to a punch bag. He goes, go on, give it a kick. And from there, just, you know, slowly built up the rehab. It was about seven months, but after that, seven months of pain. But in the end, it got me back. It got me back kickboxing. But like oh, I wow. said, in the end, I, I, I fell out of it because I just knew longevity wise. And then obviously with training in the gym for kickboxing, I sort of bitten them by bodybuilding and seeing that as a another sort of adventure to keep my keep my competitive nature in check so oh, yeah and now are you still competing in that sort of thing i am yeah yeah I've, i haven't competed now in four years but i competed all the way from 2011 up to 2017 
Oh, and wow. I was, are you an IFBB pro or how does no, that no, no. I, I would have, I would have placed in the national level in Ireland in the, mm-hmm. the top six regularly. And then I would have won a, a regional level. And then I, I did represent Ireland once internationally at the IFBB European Championships. Oh, so there's a, like a European side of it. Interesting. Okay. It, it, there's an amateur side to it. Yeah. I have no oh. interest. I've no interest in being a professional bodybuilder, but. Uh, oh man, body- the amount of drugs and <laughs> like, not even, so not even the drugs part, getting to the genetic engineering part of what you're doing to your body to get to the top 20 or whatever that would be. Now you're like literally doing things at the genetic level that can change you for the rest of your life. Like, yeah. I don't know about that. Like, I, and I know they're doing something crazy. Like, I know they have to be doing some gene editing stuff or whatever you would be doing at a top level to be able to even win. Like, that's nuts. Yeah, no, there, there is a genetic component to it, obviously. And then obviously the, the polypharmacy that comes with elite level bodybuilding and sort of how I've gained, I guess, notoriety within the UK and, and Europe is as an outspoken pharmacologist that eventually had enough of what you'd call bro science on forums <laughs> and, and literally and just like, like, speaking of that. So <laughs> what is CYP for the enzymes and how does that affect like drug usage? So the CYP 450s are the cytochrome P450. They're, they're oxidative enzymes with that reside throughout our whole body, but mainly specifically in the liver. And what they do is they facilitate metabolism of compounds in our body. So whether that's metabolism for excretion or whether it's metabolism to activate a compound similar to how, you know, the pro hormones of the 2000s worked. The CYP450s do chemical reactions that change the structure of a compound, whether favorably or unfavorably. Um, When it comes to drug metabolism, you then have different subsets of cytochrome P450 families that each family of enzyme has its own unique methods of chemical transformation. So these CYP450 enzymes are fascinating to scientists because they can do chemical reactions that we could only dream of on a benchtop. Oh. They, they, they do some transformative processes that to be honest, leaves a lot of, I remember doing this with like retro synthesis in, in university. And then obviously during um, some of the pharmacology lectures, and I was literally like going from molecule A to molecule B and literally the arrow just had CYP enzyme. There was no, you know, mechanistic approach to how the enzyme worked. It was literally oh, wow. this molecule gets turned into this almost like magic. Interesting. So, the CYP450s, we have a, a class known as the 3A4. The CYP3A4 works to oxidize testosterone, so it inactivates testosterone for metabolism. So when we're talking about metabolism oh. and excretion, when your body metabolizes a drug, as I said, it changes the structure of the compound. So when you oxidize testosterone, you're now changing the structure of the testosterone that it's no longer testosterone, basically. And it would it's be an, it's turned a, it's into a, aromatase a, and an estradiol? No, it'd be a new molecule. So a, just an oxidized form of testosterone that would not have an affinity anymore for the androgen receptor. So what, what basically can happen is these CYP enzymes can dictate how well someone metabolizes and excretes a compound. And I kind of knew that functionally, right? Because when we're talking about so, so we have these hyper responder kids that you could give them, you know, 10 milligrams, 50 milligrams, right? And it yep. drums them up to like 2000 where I'm a, I'm a big guy right now. So I'm two, 270. I used to be like 150 pounds and I'm 270 and it takes me 290 milligrams to get up to 50 free testosterone, right? So yep. the average person, it's not like what happens. And then no. when I heard you talk about it, I was like, it, it clicked and I was like, oh. Okay, this makes a little bit more sense about why you can't just say 100 milligrams is good for everybody, right? Like, it well, that, didn't make sense to me until you mentioned it. And I mean, this is a whole flaw to modern medicine, like I was sort of hinting at earlier, is that we are starting to, uh, I guess, come around to the idea of personalized medicine, which is purely dictated off your genetics. So 
as you said, with the CYP enzymes, you can have someone who's technically a plus plus variant. And plus plus means that they're just a, a hyper responder, a, an ultra metabolizer. So the ultra metabolizer means that they will excrete the compound much more quickly than a normal person. So in other words, an ultra metabolizer needs more of a drug in order to see a therapeutic effect. Now, this is interesting, too, because when we're talking about like pharmacology and drugs in the United States, we use ketamine in an ambulance. So because of so many people that are allergic to morphine and I guess whatever process that would convert morphine, we use ketamine in the back of an ambulance because you can pretty much give that to anybody. And there's a standardized dosage for that and they don't have problems. with it. Yeah. So, again, it comes down to how ketamine is metabolized. And also, if you administer a drug through IV, the, the fact of the matter is that the, the drug is freely available to act on tissues without any sort of metabolism mm -hmm. so we we always we always compare bioavailability which is how freely available a drug is to buy it at a receptor site in the body based off iv being 100 percent. so when we administer oh, okay. something through iv it, it has basically 100 percent bioavailability to act on, on it basically partitions throughout the whole body so the safety and, basically for testosterone mm -hmm. cypionate is that it's IM and it's slowly absorbable, but you're getting it over a, a duration of time. Exactly, yeah. And, and But then again, that still brings genetic variants because you'll have genetic variants to the phosphodiesterase enzyme that cleaves off the cypionate ester. So the cypionate ester is just a play on pharmacology in order to extend the half-life of the drug. Oh, and so, yeah, so, propionate is like the fast-acting, and then you have uh, enanthate also? Yeah, and then you have decimo weight, and then you have sustenin, which would be a blend of, of the four between decimo weight, propionate, cypionate, and phenylpropionate. Derek from War Plates, More Dates has like kind of mentioned the fact that, so with these mixes, right, the whole point of testosterone cypionate and, and the other esters is right, it's, it's at a constant rate, whereas if you throw in a blend, your hormones are going yeah. up and down, up and down, and up and down, base in trouble, base in trouble. And you, you have no, your body doesn't know when it stops and when it ends. So like, it sounds good on paper. And I, I mean, for an individual it might be okay, but for like a population, you can't just say, oh, well, there's three you on this drug. It's going to have these random ups and downs. Yeah. Like yeah. hormones are going to be but, messed off. But, but that's the prescription guide. So obviously the prescription guidelines in the UK versus the US are very different. Um, licensed wise, if you go for TRT within the UK, normally testo gel is the first option that's offered, yeah. which is horrendous. And then after that, if you don't want to opt down the route of a, a gel application route, you then are um, offered sustenin. And normally that sustenin oh, right. is, is an administered injection by a nurse once every three weeks. <laughs> so and, and, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, my, my grug plumber kind of speak. What that means is you're going to go up to 5,000 nanograms per deciliter. You're going to dump out at like maybe 100 or less. And your free yes. testosterone is going to go from 100 down to literally zero, where you could have just been at 20 the whole entire time on one ester if you did it twice a week and you'd yep. be fine. But yet you're not. And now you're going to have all these hormonal changes and your, your life's going to suck. Yeah. And I mean, at some point, even in the UK, before sustenin, the real archaic prescription guidelines was a 200 milligram shot of testosterone under cyclinate, which is to me mind boggling. I'm going to give you an injection. I'll see you in 10 weeks time. <laughs> and like that, that to me, even from a pharmacological perspective is nuts because when we're administering therapies to people, we want to administer the most stable dosing regimen. So it's not like, you know, when someone has an injury that we plow them with painkillers for three days, then go, oh, for the rest of the week, you get none. <laughs> yeah. And then and then Sunday we'll plow you again for another three days of painkillers and then give you none. Like, we don't do this. Like, that's not how we approach pharmacology. So it's the same scenario applies when it comes to testosterone. I, I, By but the, the way, the problem, you're literally the only person in America and in, and in Europe who's talking about this. You're the only one. Yeah. And I yeah. was really pissed off when I <laughs> when I listened to your podcast. I'm okay, you know, I'm a high school dropout. Uh, you know, I'm a consultant, and I've gotten to do some pretty high level jobs with the government and 
you know, I can do some various things, but I'm playing catch up. I don't know anything about science. I don't know anything about really basic, you know, medicine or basic pharmacology. And I'm having to learn this from like the top guy, you know, and you're talking to bodybuilders and different stuff. And I'm trying to get this down to, okay, you were in a car accident. You're a veteran. You have traumatic brain injury, but no one else is talking about the metabolism side or like the dosing side of TRT. And it's even Dr. Mark Gordon, who's like the expert at TBI. Even he isn't talking about it because he's trying to do this general education kind of thing. But even him, like he'll catch himself and he'll, he'll say this, uh, like low normal or, um, at the whatever point of the reference range. And so I got really irritated and I, emailed uh dr travison who did the um the hormone oh what did, what was the name of his article um harmon the harmonized reference ranges so the harmonized reference ranges for all of europe and the united states are from this one guy travison and he did an epidemiological study of all um this population sample size of like I think it was 9,000 people or something like that. And so the reference range that we use for Quest and LabCorp and even the ones that are done for the, the, the National Health Services of the UK and Ireland are using Travison's research. And it's an epidemiological range of just a study that he did, but they're applying it to all these populations. And yep. so I, I emailed the guy and I'm like, okay, so what's going on with this? And he says, you know... Um, for all of our epi epidemiological database work, we expect providers that would interpret what we have published as part of a picture and broadly applicable to a population, but may, may not have relevance to a particular patient or clinical circumstance. And I just yeah, got furious. Just... Like, I, I'm the only guy who's asking this? Like, come on. Like, this is ridiculous. Yeah, and I mean, even... So, from my understanding from consulting with people in, in the U.S., Obtaining a prescription for TRT within the US is, is a lot less stringent than the UK. Yes, it's so off-label. So it's uh, basically any medication that has been approved by the FDA that's safe, a doctor can then prescribe that off-label. Now, right, your um, Medicaid, which is our National Health Service, and then our TRICARE, which is the Veterans Health Service, and like your regular insurance is not going to cover that. So you have to pay for it in cash, but it's an off-label thing. So even if it's metformin or even off-label ketamine or morphine, it's safe and doctors can prescribe it off-label, but it's not going to be covered by our insurance. Though. Yeah, so the, the, the classification of hormones within the UK and Ireland is that they are approved for human use, but they're, they're not a, a generally prescribed compound so in other words you <laughs> generally prescribe uh, 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 a so, functional medication that's yeah. required to live and not have a stroke or a heart attack okay. yeah so <laughs> in other words to get trt in the uk you have to have sub 7 nanomolar which is like i think if we do the conversion it's about 220 nanograms per yeah, that sounds right. yeah it's like the so, lower end of like the bulk it, numbers that so, are so, different 2013 uh, numbers yeah, so we'll, we'll just even say sub two hundred nanogram per deciliter testosterone level. <laughs> you have you have to have that consecutively twice on two blood work panels, six months apart. Six months apart. Six. You can months. have a heart attack. Or a <laughs> that time. And well, okay, so for the people that don't understand, right, we're using nanograms per deciliter total testosterone, but that free testosterone is literally like. 0.1% or something like that. Yeah, and literally you can die. So like that's how dangerous that that is. So that number may sound like it's a big number, but when we use the real numbers, which is the free testosterone numbers, those yeah. are deadly numbers. Yeah. And now you might get lucky and your SHPG might be, you know, low normal that you're sort of getting away with just about having enough free testosterone for the receptors. But okay. I mean, six, six months apart, six months of hypogonadal symptoms true hypogonadal symptoms you know you could have somewhat major depressive disorder oh yeah and, oh, I'll suicidal see in six, ideation uh, yeah and all kinds you know of that, yeah. i'll see in six months time it's <laughs> it's and then after that you have to battle to get prescribed sustenin never mind stable hormone panel levels sustenin is your sort of redemption wow. one injection every three weeks so it's stuff like that ha has really annoyed me and more so when I met my wife in 2015, she 
she got me on social media. She was like, you, you know, too much, you know, you know, too much. You need to get out there and start educating people because I was like, I still am a little introverted. Like I I keep to myself, but if someone wants to have a chat, I'm, I'm all, I'm all ears. And, you know, I don't, I don't go around, you know, trying to lecture people or whatever. But when it, when it came, when it came to like this sort of topic, my wife was like, no, seriously, you, you know too much here to keep this to yourself. Which I mentioned to Dr. Travison, so you should definitely reach out to him too and to Dr. Morgan Thaler and to do a to get into the, the, the popular media into the, I don't know, whatever magazines, Curves Magazine and ABC News or whatever the kind of normy kind of stuff and get this out there into the public. Because also, so Dr. Morgenthaler, he's doing all the fancy, you know, population studies and cool research and stuff like that. But even him, right, he's doing some of that kind of stuff to get out there. But there's not really anybody in the public that's like a a champion for this. But also, too, we have literally millions of veterans that are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan and veterans from, you know, from from Ireland as well. You know, they're a bunch of... um, of uh, pro- uh, protective security guys who are running the routes in Iraq and Afghanistan. And these guys are getting hit every single day. And there are a lot of people who on a, like a population level. So like Sweden, right? They're losing 20 guys at a time, right? For them, that's a population of like a hundred percent casualties. Right. So I mean, I, I joke about it a little bit, but right. It's a, that's a lot of people for like their small little country. And they got a lot of people that need traumatic brain injury treatment and yeah. no one's connecting the two except for Dr. Mark Gordon. And people are just kind of playing catch up with, OK, you were in a car accident and now six months later you come in and now your testosterone levels are tanked and everything is bad. And nobody's yeah. getting ahead of that. No. And, and like you bring up a, a very interesting point because I have a very close friend who is a an emergency medicine doctor in Australia and someone close to him was in quite a bad car accident. And he's he's told me personally only for he was at the scene when the accident happened. Oh wow! That this person would not have had a favorable outcome. Now we're talking quite severe front lobal injury after being basically t barred to the side of their driver's side mm. at ninety miles an hour. So, and and he personally then obviously then took care of this person to his own extent and you know optimized hormones optimized you know blood serum levels of certain minerals yeah stuff that you know t- to him was just second nature because he he thinks very similarly to me in in terms of a a holistic approach to medicine yeah and i remember him telling me that within the intensive care unit there was three other people who had suffered tbis and that basically they were, they were there now, I think at least six or seven months still, still under palliative care oh, where, wow. where when they got injured, had there been an intervention in place, uh, like, you know, immediately the outcome of survival for those people would have been a lot higher. Uh, and the now that we're that, talking about the clearance rates and like how that works. So even in, in a worst case scenario in which you gave someone say like a gram of testosterone, something crazy, right? you can still reverse the effects that will be bad. So if all their hormone levels are tanked, you can still give that to them in a certain amount of time before it's going to take its total effect on the person. And in a short duration of time, be able to keep those, those levels stable. And then once they're healed up and whatnot, then you can take them completely off of it. And they, they may go back to their normal status and have, you know, decent levels or whatnot. But in an emergency care situation, there's no, there's no, negatives in terms of of providing them those hormones so that they can heal and get better exactly yeah but i mean more so that's where the uh, like uh, so i gave a talk on the pharmacology of anabolic steroids uh, at a quite a a public event in 2019 where there was quite a number of general practitioner doctors that attended the talk for cpd so i remember at the end of the talk these doctors come up and said, you know, we were never taught any of this at medical school. And it's such a, it's such a taboo subject to even consider these compounds. Yet I turn around to them and say, well, you do realize that 
testosterone was first isolated and synthesized as a medicine and there, therefore then followed the structure activity relationships to develop new steroids and out of that came dianabol anavar um anadrol or uh, uh, um, oxymetalone you know we we have these compounds that are technically medicines they're not and they're used they're, for burn patients yeah you the, know it's well, not anavar is a burn uh, burn patient medication so it was intended. yeah yeah, and, and also, we well, I'm not going to say stupidly, but this is how medicine evolves as well with silly mistakes. But, you know, it was prescribed to children. It was yes. prescribed to female, young female girls pre-puberty that ended up causing a lot of hormonal issues later on because, you know, when medicine puts prescription guidelines in place, some of the top, some, some of the top presses is behind doctors is, oh, this book says X to be prescribed, therefore I'm going to prescribe X without actually thinking back to their pharmacology training. Right now I'm going through with, um, so I'm using this fancy New York uh, University doctor. She like directly knows Dr. Morgan Thaler and she's like done lectures at Harvard and stuff like that. But growth hormone, you know, we know that we need to put me on it, and it's directly advised for someone who's had traumatic brain injury. It's one of the things that the guidelines state yeah. that for yeah. growth hormone to be prescribed, it has to meet these certain guidelines. Well, even though I meet those certain guidelines, you have to meet these stupid, arbitrary IGF-1 levels for Four growth levels. hormone, yeah. and a doctor can't prescribe it off-label. So they can prescribe me a gram of testosterone right now, and it's fine, but they can't do a clinical dosage of growth hormone. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, this is my doctor. She can't do this. I'm like, yeah. this is insane. Like, I've never heard of this before. And to be honest, that same scenario there with the UK and pre prescribing testosterone for, for placement therapy, a lot of guys go down the route of self-medicating. And, you know, yeah. over the last... Over the last four years, I've ran like a private consult service as a pharmacologist where guys can discuss blood work with me because they're getting nowhere with the health service. Yeah. And, you know, hypothetically educating them on the compound. And, you know, if they choose to go down that route rather than going, OK, I'm just going to go to the nearest guy that sells the, you know, the, the local <sighs> underground stuff. And I'm just yeah. going to start injecting two mils into myself without any, you know, understanding of the pharmacology or the repercussions to my health literally put the education into that person's hand yeah because their gp isn't taking them seriously and you know make them aware that there are negatives to going down this route and that you know it's it's not wise to just blindly inject testosterone into yourself not at all no and and, yeah. to, and to understand the health implications but also understand the responsibility now that if you're going down this I guess, quote unquote, privatized route that you should be using private blood work services to monitor your health by yourself. And it's not and, that difficult, right? It's total. To, well, no, not, not the, like the other part of it when you're abusing things, but standard blood testing, total testosterone, free testosterone, LH, FSH, TSH, throw in a PSA if you're prostate and an A1C to make sure you don't have a, a metabolic disease. Yeah, follow those things or whatnot for your initial blood work. Now, obviously, this gets a lot more complicated with you know guys that are bodybuilding and are using 500 plus or more of testosterone and then throwing in random drugs or something like that. Yeah, uh, or uh, say nandrolone and decanate, which has its own host of problems beyond a certain um, uh, milligrams exactly. or whatnot. But you know, throwing in those different things will you know change things. Um, so uh, you know, kind of getting off of uh, off of that part, I wanted to ask you: Where do you see hormone replacement optimization going in the future? So, if the if the last ten to fifteen years are anything to go by, the, we still have to work on removing that stigma within the medical community, and having people like myself that are willing to educate medical professionals on reversing that stigma to be honest because currently if say now I, i'm going to speak from the side of a recreational anabolics user approaching their gp 
I'm, no, I'm don't. Not, <laughs> I'm not trained in it. They don't even know testosterone's in women, let alone how much <laughs> it's supposed to be in men. Honestly, don't even talk to them. But they're yeah. not qualified, right? They can't look at a reference range, and they can't just off of hand know that, okay, Dr. Travis did an epidemiological study, right? Unless, yeah. I mean, I even asked. No, no one else is talking about it. Even Dr. Mark Gordon isn't talking about it. Asking her GP is worthless. Like... <laughs> Uh, but even then, if a guy within Ireland goes to see their GP and says, oh, I took steroids, I need to get my blood work done. Uh, doctor, doctors doctors treat them with this huge stigma. Whereas if you were, say, a heroin addict and you went to your GP and said, oh, I- I'd like to get off heroin and, and go down the, the methadone replacement route. You know, you're easily facilitated there. Really? And it's sort of like there's this demonized stigma that has been driven into Irish and UK medicine that, oh, you've done steroids, you're, you're terrible. Yet, you know, your next door neighbor could be morbidly obese and smokes 40 <laughs> cigarettes a day yeah. and goes to the GP with high blood pressure and nothing's, nothing said. Like it's, that stigma is what's sort of stopping things progressing in, in Ireland. And that's again, where I, I have consulted a, a, as a pharmacologist with a lot of GPs on, People that have messaged me, you know, sent me an email and said, well, I'm getting over with my GP, but my GP is open to discussing things with you on your expert level. Interesting. Okay. I'm, I'm more so. Okay. I like that. That's No, that's good. That's a good step. My, I actually haven't heard that before. The, uh, I guess the other side that I've become notorious for, if, if you listen to them part two of that Muscle Mentors podcast was... I went into the flaws of PCT. And, oh, and, yes. And, so now, and, not necessarily on bodybuilding, but let's kind of, I'm going to, I'm going to align this in terms of TRT and like optimization. Yep. When we're talking about fertility and TRT, I'm going to go on a limb and say, okay, you don't necessarily need a fertility medication, but you should add it and you should freeze your semen and you should at least know where that's at. And then use HCG or some other fertility medicine, not Clomid, maybe n since it doesn't cause permanent blindness. Um, use a different type of fertility medication on the safe side, but there is no such thing as a post-cycle for TRT yeah, and nope. for optimization. So if any doctor ever says, oh, you need to come off of this and cycle this, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> and I've heard doctors say this. And yeah. from Dr. Scott Howell, he talked about how the androgen receptors, once they are upregulated and there's more upregulation, that produces more androgen receptors, but there's no such thing as burning them out nope. or stopping them, I guess. Is that correct? Nope. nope, exactly correct. And I said this from day one surrounding bro science. Now, for, for TRT, that is completely correct. Once. So how I approach this, obviously, for for recreational bodybuilders is that this argument of using HCG when on a cycle of testosterone or anabolic steroids. And I I sort of brought an idea to the to the bodybuilding scene of we have this concept of blasting and cruising, which is ridiculous. You may as well just do 700 or say 650 milligrams the entire time. And just yeah. be at that one dosage for the rest of your life. <laughs> I don't understand why you would want it. So, okay. Now, actually, something well, that I, I would think is interesting for you to think about, though, is so for TRT and say that you're getting up to, so our, our great, great, great grandparents are probably at like 2,000 to 5,000 nanograms per deciliter total testosterone, right? Yeah. Over a course of 10 years, what would be the drawback of increasing it to the point where maybe you were at a gram or maybe you were at like 700, right? It sounds kind of ridiculous on its face, but what would be the problem necessarily over a per- period of time, say 10 years or whatnot, going up to something like that so you're at these these levels, but you're safely doing it? I, I guess the, the whole safety then falls back to the oxidative stress that androgens place in the body themselves, so we don't have really a, a, an overall predictive model of, of how they're going to interfere with arteriosclerosis development um, and then also I guess the impact it has in the liver towards hepatic lipase and also most people aren't aware when you're at super physiological levels of androgens whether that's under TRT 
or or otherwise, the mesenchymal stem cells of the liver can never enter to cause liver cell regeneration. This is a huge thing that guys don't consider. So what level would that be at, though? So it would be back to your physiological baseline. So wherever you were as a natural, normal person. So I always sort of try and make Uh, people aware that if you're going down this route of blasting and cruising, I prefer the term to do a cycle of anabolic steroids and then fall back to TRT. Because at that point, you can fall back to a, a physiological dose, somewhere that falls within a physiological range of between for us in the uk between 10 and 30 nanomolars or for the us it's probably between 400 and 1200 nanograms i i'd prefer someone to to fall back to trt allow that physiological baseline to have its beneficial effect on their body because to be honest testosterone is bioidentical so whether you get it from an injection or you may make it naturally and it's the same effect the only thing with trt i make people aware of is that obviously you're FSH and LH, your pituitary function is shut down. So, yes, yes, you will have a a fertility impact, but from a stable health perspective, falling back to that physiological dose will will have more of a beneficial impact than cycling, as in coming on and off continuously. And there's really, I don't see what the, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. You just have, you just take fertility medication, you freeze your sperm just in case, and then you do a dose that's safe for you. But I don't get why you would want to, well, go super, super high and risk your health, but then also not adding a fertility medication so that you protect yourself. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, well, the other thing I I sort of uh, argue against is in the context of super physiological doses of testosterone is the use of HCG in my mind. HCG in the context of somebody who's on TRT for life who has either primary hypergonadism or relies on that optimized testosterone level hcg is clinically important there as as we know so there's there's nothing to argue in that regard towards the research that john chrysler put out but in the context of super physiological levels hcg's action as a, a mimetic for luteinizing hormone if you're putting that into your body and you're at super physiological levels of androgens it's stimulating your testicles, but doing nothing. And to me, that late egg cell st- stimulation offers no benefit versus if you are at a physiological dose for TRT, that late egg cell stimulation will generate some level of intratesticular testosterone, which then stimulates the Sertoli cells to create sperm in conjunction with any transient FSH in the body. Oh, so you still actually have to have that process. Yes. Oh. Okay. So I was misunderstanding that it it basically worked at, at all times. It doesn't matter which dose. So you still so, actually have to have a response for the feedback mechanism to work. Not necessarily the feedback of the HPTA, but the the cells themselves. So if you if you stimulate the latex cells with HCG. First and foremost, it stimulates the cell, so it volumizes the cell back to original function. And there, from there, the latex cells can then create um, testosterone from cholesterol synthesis. So we, we end up then with intratesticular testosterone that has its own beneficial effects. And that's where that's where the use of HCG becomes very important in a, in a post-cycle therapy setting for somebody who's coming off TRT or coming off anabolic steroids because what we're trying to do there is stimulate the latex cells, create some intratesticular testosterone, and that will then have a positive effect on the hypothalamus to get gonadotropin releasing hormone secreting. Now, I've mentioned this in kind of one of my other podcasts or whatnot. So say there's a, someone who cannot tolerate testosterone at all. The use of, say, nandrolone decanate and HCG or using another type of of steroid that's not going through the testosterone um, cascade, but going in a different mechanism and having that fertility side of things is probably a good plan. So if you're just someone who the one in 10,000 people or whoever who can't handle it, it's a good option to at least have in your back pocket that you know, okay, Nandrolone Decanate exists and you can go through a different pathway to get things upwards. 
but you may not have the problems or you could use another type of medication alongside a fertility medication that's going to be able to keep you somewhat in a higher androgen environment if you can't you know make that medication work yeah and then we also have to consider um human menopausal gonadotropin or hmg which is a synthetic derivative of directly fsh which will have an, a just a stimulatory aspect on the sertoli cells so one who's on trt who comes back with a low sperm count can use hmg in that setting to drive sperm production directly I know we use it in the United States for fertility directly when people are trying to get um, their significant other pregnant, but I, I don't really know if anybody's prescribing it alongside TRT. No, no, not from it. And again, that, that comes back to approaching the science of pharmacology and understanding, you know, these drugs, how these drugs work and the end goal. So especially for someone who say, chronically uses anabolic steroids, not even TRT, a, a, a recreational bodybuilder, the use of HMG is probably that person's best bet really? um, to raise their sperm if they have significantly lower levels of sperm. But again, it comes back to... And is that going to stimulate the latex cells and the spermatoli? Uh, is that what they call called? Uh, 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 so it'll it'll stim stimulate the sertoli cells, which cause spermatogenesis. So okay. your, your testicles are divided into latex cells and sertoli cells. Um, and does HMG act that way? Also. The HMG works specifically on the Sertoli cells. So it's basically a synthetic form of FSH. Okay. So okay. within a male's body, a natural male, when they make LH and FSH in the pituitary, on a simple level, the LH goes to the Leydig cell and creates testosterone. And the FSH goes to the Sertoli cell and creates sperm. That's how male hormones work on a simple level. I, and I appreciate that simplicity because even like your regular doctor isn't going to know that. And honestly, I've been pretty pissed off with urologists and, and, uh, and <laughs> endocrinologists. My reasoning behind that is the fact that they've let the situation get as bad as they have. And they gave up testosterone replacement in the United States. Pretty much the only people who are doing real testosterone replacement therapy is functional medicine doctors or yep. people who took it upon themselves to go to World Link or to go to A4MG or you know, A4M and AMG and get those certifications. But the urologists and, and, and endocrinologists, they just gave up. They're just not even dealing with it. But you know, we have a 10 times bigger you know, population and they're dealing with metabolic disease and cancer every day. Like I can't yeah. imagine having to get some random guy come in like, okay, your testosterone's at 500, you're symptomatic. I guess we'll give you enclomiphene. Come back to me in a week. I, I, that would be terrible for them because they're constantly getting cancer patients. And I, I don't, I don't understand what that would be like as a doc because you don't see that every single day in their yeah, defense. yeah. And that, that is it. The whole metabolic syndrome debate of what's being driven by the environment and then obviously lifestyle and nutrition. Guys, guys don't realize also that when you sort of go down the TRT route metabolic processes upregulate so your, your ability to oxidize glucose significantly increases your ability to oxidize triglycerides significantly increases when you remove that trt or you remove an anabolic steroid cycle there's huge potential there for metabolic syndrome to develop really and, and i see it quite often with guys who cease an anabolic steroid cycle recover back to a natural normal hbta function and yet their ferritin is sky high their hba and c is elevated by about five points um we see elevations in triglycerides in the blood work but we see all these effects that are indicative of a low hormone environment or an environment that is not receiving the same androgen receptor signal as it was previously at a, a higher dose Interesting. And that and that in itself will bring negative health consequences. So I always even warn anabolic steroid users who are going down the path of of cycling steroids that when all is said and done, it's not even the risk of primary hypergonadism or even secondary hypergonadism developing. It's insulin resistance in response to that metabolic syndrome. And in my and opinion, this, right, these are levels that we would have been at like hundreds of years ago if you were doing like an anabolic steroid cycle. And the fact that the body knows that 
and the body knows that it's supposed to protect itself against these. Uh, you know, you you stumble upon um, a beehive and you're going to ingest a ton of glucose at one time. And, you know, you're a warrior and you're going to go off and go fight a tribe. Right. And you're going to burn off all that stuff and it's going to be fine because you're at these super high levels of testosterone. But in our you know, you're in a cubicle dwelling environment. You're surrounded by estrogenic uh, you know, contaminants yeah. and water. It just completely destroys your body no matter what. Like, <laughs> yeah, and that's why, why, like, again, the whole environmental setting and um, I guess xenoestrogens are, are everywhere and here to stay. And, and guys aren't even aware of that to some extent. And not to mention, so, you know, in the United States and, and, and I would say probably 1% also of the European population who went to Iraq and Afghanistan as well. We're talking about burn pits, talking about uranium that they're burning and yeah. cordite and God knows what that we were using um, that are out there in those war zones. And that all affects you. And from my understanding, even if you haven't actually been to a burn pit, once you're exposed to that environment in general, you just step foot in Kuwait or Iraq or Afghanistan, you are contaminated day one with burn pit exposure. And that goes directly into your lungs and then affects the rest of your body and destroys all your androgens. So it really doesn't matter if you were there for a year or a day, you've been exposed and you need to be evaluated for it. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. It's 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 absolutely shocking. Um, so, you know, yeah, we've been yeah, almost yeah. at like kind of a, an hour or so far. Um, you know, I don't want to take too much of your time. I, I like to get so in a perfect world and yeah. the person who... So say you found a clinic or, okay, so you know that you have, um, you know, these issues with hypogonadism or whatnot, how would you create a protocol for that person? So me, right? I got a hit in a, in a, a explosion, got a car accident. My testosterone levels were down to like 300, fully symptomatic, depression, erectile dysfunction, feel like shit, gained about a hundred pounds. What's kind of like the perfect protocol for someone like that? Right. I guess that's safe. <laughs> uh, that, yeah, that's safe. I, I guess first and foremost, like obviously what was probably assessed first and foremost is the the extent to the injury and obviously the inflammation within uh, within any of the, the cortexes of the brain. And then from there, um assessing what 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 symptoms we have to address initially and obviously assessing patient history if we have prior blood work of where that person's baseline health was naturally also so in other words um let's say prior to to brain injury that person's testosterone level was i, I don't know for for uk values let's say 25 nanomolar which is like the near upper end of the the normal scale probably close to a thousand on the us scale and that person now has i guess from a, a tbi um, some of the cells, either the hypogonadic neurons within the hypothalamus have been injured or there's areas of the pituitary that have been damaged that no longer secrete LH and FSH. We then need to assess where's the optimum level to bring that person's testosterone back to. And if their prior baseline was a 1,000 nanograms per deciliter, well then it makes clinical sense to bring them back to that natural baseline of where they were previously mm -hmm. um in the, in the context of a tbi it's a it's a lot more i guess urgent that we get normal hormone function back because obviously we can't we can't create neurons so obviously neurogenesis causes neurons to to lengthen but when we lose neuronal cells they're gone it's we, we don't have the capability to in, induce stem cell proliferation of, of neuronal cells. And that's where, you know, we're, we're lucky that our brains have plasticity in that the neurons themselves and the synapses can create new connections. So that's how your brain compensates after a TBI in that you, you upregulate the synaptic connections to improve synaptic signaling. Whereas before you would have had, you know, a higher level of neurons, you've now got more synaptic connections compensating for that lower neuron uh, count number. I, I guess you can then try and stimulate 
neurogenesis, which is, like I said, the, the growth of existing neurons. But that in itself will only bring, I guess, um, limited recovery. But it's better than, than zero recovery when you're at a very low hormone level. How would you stimulate the neuron side of things? So I guess there's the likes of cognitive behavioral therapy, of, of actual um, arithmetic and problem solving, um, I guess, programs that we can use to increase the, the number of synaptic connections in our brain to improve that communication. Um, we could look at neurotransmitter optimization so whether we we try and increase choline levels within the brain so we either slow down acetylcholine breakdown or we provide more choline donors um that will aid looked much into it and actually people haven't really talked about choline to be honest as something to add into like tbi post recovery kind of stuff interesting so so alpha gpc which is alpha glycerophosphate phosphate choline it's a it's a form of choline with a glycerol phosphate group attached to it which is quite a fatty um a fatty loving source of choline so it's able to penetrate into the blood brain barrier very efficiently and deliver choline directly to to neurons so it is a, a fantastic supplement that can be implemented in people who have had tbis to in, try and increase concentration and then we have you know natural acetylcholine esterase inhibitors like huperzine or um, oh okay galantamine these are two you know plant derived compounds that slow down the degradation of choline so in other words you're now causing a huge spike in choline in someone's brain which drives their concentration interesting so that's nobody explained it to me what it actually did like uh, my my nurse prac said hey you should try this and i was reading about it i could not it, it wasn't anything that was generalized it was all like super high speed like you had to be a doc or a pharmacologist to understand this stuff i'm like i don't know what this is i've never heard of it and there was nothing i could read on it so i was like really frustrated <laughs> and there's just interest in research if you look into alpha gpc at very high dosages in um in older populations so in in like late 50s 60s where higher levels of alpha GPC actually stimulated the pituitary at night in order to drive growth hormone secretion. Oh, so it's it's yeah. a it's an it's a it's a natural somatotropic releasing compound when taken in higher dosages. So that's something that you can look into. And you're, you're looking at you know you're looking at dosages, quite high doses of nearly like one point two to two grams of alpha GPC. Oh wow! Which okay. which can be expensive if you look at for a really good quality dosed alpha GPC. But, the, you know, the research is there on the, the augmented effect of, of increasing GH secretion during sleep, deep sleep. But, you know, has a positive benefit then to your to your concentration. But with, with the assessment, then obviously with someone's TBI, you also then need to consider, does that person need, uh, I guess, immediate adjuvant therapy where potentially we, we could use something like a... A, a glucocorticoid inhibitor so we're, we're going to lower levels of glucocorticoids that's going to drive inflammation in the body um oh so this is the opposite of i heard somebody was talking about using like super high dosages of fish oil and it made sense kind of like in that kind of minor context but it also makes a little bit more sense now the crap that happens for glucocorticoids where you know you have a higher dosage of this for an inflammatory response right you're you're wreaking all kinds of havoc on the body although in an immediate sense right it's kind of a good plan but then you're still depleting a bunch of stuff in the body that you know you need yeah and that, that's where so androgens themselves are glucocorticoid receptor inhibitors and that's oh. where we see that's where we see that anti-catabolic effect of of androgens is the so steroid hormone receptors i don't have a specific affinity so testosterone can bind to any steroid hormone receptor. It's the affinity that it's going to have for that receptor, if that makes sense. Yeah. So and it's over the body, right? It's synergistic throughout all the tissues. Uh, yeah. So, so you'll have mineral corticoids. So they're the likes of aldosterone um, an antidiuretic hormone that control, you know, mineral and 
fluid balance of the body. So that's how testosterone and estrogen can have an effect on your mineral and water balance. And that's where you see guys oh, it's from that getting... process. Like, I didn't know the, the technical part of the process. Yeah. And that's where guys get heavily bloated from high levels of estrogen. Um, you have the positive benefits on the glucocorticoid receptors where, um, I guess, competitive inhibition where testosterone binds to that glucocorticoid receptor, now blocking it from being activated by a glucocorticoid like cortisol. Oh, so this explains and, and this I, one study where there was the only one study that we have of higher dosages for testosterone, which was like 650 milligrams. And they're using it for cancer patients. So this explains yeah. that study of why they were doing that. Yeah, and you're, you're basically providing an anti-catabolic nature. And that's why we prescribe Anovar in this, the context of burn patients or HIV patients. Oh, wow. So so we're, we're sort of coming from the aspect of, yes, androgen receptor activation will cause muscle protein synthesis and central nervous system activation to elicit a stronger central nervous system response and make you stronger. But you also have an effect then on these glucocorticoid receptors to lower inflammation. So they have positive benefits in that regard. And this is one of the things about why I've been kind of speculating that. So even though in a traditional kind of context of, of testosterone placement therapy, where we would normally use like say 200 to or 100 to basically 300, that maybe even pushing the boundaries once you've been dialed in could have some sort of positive effect over time for the TBI patient where maybe other people wouldn't necessarily need something like a higher dosage, but where we're going to get all these different positive effects. If you're kind of pushing it upwards, you know, beyond the 50, uh, 50 nanogram per deciliter free testosterone level, pushing it even upwards into the hundreds, but that you're kind of balancing on that almost the steroid cycle, but kind of not TRT, but you're pushing it in that higher level of dosage to then upregulate all these other processes. As long as you don't have high DHT and then high, two symptoms that are going to cause you problems yeah i mean that's where the sort of blanket statement of going in at a high dose is that you can't predict a person's uh, aromatase activity or their five alpha reductase uh, which will also bring negative connotations yeah. also so that's sort of where understanding the the pharmacy of the anabolic steroids themselves there's even merit here for a TBI patient immediately to receive, you know, a very low dose of Trembolone. Uh, what does Trembolone uh, do again? I, I know the medication so, name, but I, I really don't know what it does. So, so Trembolone was, was originally developed for humans for severe muscle wasting. Um, and then it was found to have quite uh, negative effects on, on human health. Um, that it's it has potential to be neurotoxic and potentially genotoxic and then it moved to more so being a, an animal veterinary product for increasing um meat generation within cattle now trembolone is probably the most androgenic compound available to us in that it, its affinity for the androgen receptors nearly 100 percent so what what that affords us is a compound that has pure anti-catabolic effects. Oh, okay. So, uh, for example, say someone has uh, received a TBI and is now bed bound for you know maybe a, a, a three week or a month period before you know we 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 regain some level of consciousness and stability. There is. Uh, you know, merit there that you could use something like Trembolone in order to stabilize a patient so that we don't see this anti-catabolic nature of, uh, true, you know, you could do muscle stimulation and massage in order to maintain muscle mass of that person. So the, the recovery post TBI in, in towards physical functional recovery is, um, augmented. Is that a 19 nor testosterone derivative? It is. It is. Yeah. Very similar to, um, Nandrolone. Okay. Okay. I've heard it, but obviously there's, there's a lot of like co health consequence kind of stuff. Oh, oh yeah. 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 yeah no. And it's, it's not, it's not at a lower for... dosage, right? You're saying that it could be potentially safe if you're doing it the right way. Exactly. But it, unfortunately now it's no longer approved for human use. The FDA ruled it in the, in the late uh, 1980s, but speaking as a, a pharmacologist and known, you know, the pharmacy of bodybuilding and why Trembolone, Trembolone is mainly used in bodybuilding as an anti-catabolic agent, you know, as a scientist, 
we're trying to improve healthcare outcomes in severely injured patients. Yeah. You know, we have these compounds available to us that with some level of intelligent use can have positive, <laughs> positive clinical outcome. What would be like a low safe dose for something like that? Oh, for Tremblone, you know, so Tremblone originally came in a, a hexylcarbamate ester, which has a half-life of between seven and 10 days. So, you know, you're, you're really talking very low levels of use, maybe 25, 30 milligrams per week. Oh, wow. Okay. Interesting. It, so it's, it's that low. Okay. Wow. But like I said, it has close to 100% affinity for the androgen receptor. So, you know, it, it outcompetes DHT and testosterone. So, oh, so you could you, even you, be you, doing like super, super low, like zero point whatever milligrams or something. Okay. Interesting. So it's, it's a really, really competitive androgen, which, like I said, has anti catabolic nature effects. So that's, you know, what we're primarily looking towards for somebody who has had a, a TBI and. Cause um, Anavar only has like what, like a 10% usage or something like that. Like, I don't think a lot of it gets used, right? So. Anavar is interesting because it's not mainly dictated by how the, the Anavar itself binds to the androgen receptor itself. It, it also binds to other receptor pockets on cells to still end up entering into our nucleus to cause, um, I guess, nuclear expression. So the, the, the oral steroids themselves are fascinating because the the competitive binding of how they bind to the androgen receptor doesn't give the full picture of actually how the the oral steroid works um oh. and that 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 brings some of the interesting theories to light that androgens themselves aren't only just dictated by your androgen receptors they can still form receptor complexes that can still enter into our nucleus so <laughs> interesting. So the 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 way Anavar and Winstrol and metal testosterone and all these oral steroids uh, influence our body is slightly different to pure androgen receptor activation of what we see with with some of the injectable forms. And obviously not as safe. And the, one of the reasons why we don't use methyl testosterone anymore, which my joke all the time is. So when a doctor says um, that. Uh, testosterone is cancer proving ask them if they're free basing methyl testosterone and if they if they give you a response of oh we don't use methyl testosterone anymore okay you know they're educated but if they're not right and they don't know the difference between it then you know you're talking to someone who should not be giving their opinion on testosterone yeah yeah and i mean like that even goes back to the simple pharmacology i mean testosterone has a half-life within our body of about two hours two to three hours so it's not it's not an easy therapy to tell someone, oh, by the way, here's your prescription for testosterone. It's oral testosterone, free based testosterone. But <laughs> unfortunately, every two hours you're gonna have to take fifty pills of it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so Which for me, I thought it was hilarious that this is the journey that I've been on where like my doctor originally had read like the package label, you know, it says like oh, it'll work every two weeks or something like that. Just give somebody an injection every two weeks. And it didn't work on me. And I was doing like 100 milligrams. And, and I found a, like a TRT clinic. And you know, they were doing like once a week. I'm like, okay, this is not working. You get these high and ups and crashes and whatnot. And I'm reading all these things online. And there were, nobody explained it, the reason why. But everybody said, oh, we'll try two times a week or try three. And three didn't really work for me. And I went to personally every single day. So I'm doing daily yeah. administration. And it's 290 milligrams a week, and it gets me to 56 free testosterone. I'm feeling good. I don't have any ups and downs and no crashes or whatnot. But it only took me actually doing that process and finding out what worked for me. And it was it was stable. But in various other people, they don't ever mention it, and they just kind of put up with these crashes. And I ask them about it, and they don't think about it. They just oh, that's just how testosterone works. I'm like. No, that's not how testosterone no. works. No. <laughs> stable blood levels if you do more injections per week. I mean, I, I, as part of the pharmacology talk I gave a couple of years ago, I put up the diurnal secretion of testosterone in a, in a natural male. And then I put up another graph with the, the drug clearance of an injection of sustenin and an injection of uh, testosterone on the cyclet. And I basically, because there was medical professionals in the audience, I put up the, the graph and obviously a male and a, 
a male that's under 30 and a male over 50 will have slightly different testosterone levels, but yeah. the di- diurnal secretion is pretty much the same. And the the levels, to be honest, if we were to pick arbitrary numbers, they probably vary by about 50 nanograms between morning and night. So there's not much, wow. there's not much variation. Which, by the way, I mean, honestly, you need to like trademark that and literally get that to every single medical school <laughs> and, yeah. and make it part, mandatory that they have to look at it. Because honestly, no one else has done this and no one knows how this stuff works. So even people who are administering it don't know the drug clearance of this medication. Um, I'll, I'll actually... Are you on your laptop at the moment? Yes, Brad? I am. Yeah. Okay. Watch. I'll, I'll, While you're I'm doing gonna... that, I'm gonna go grab my dog real quick. She's outside. One second. Okay. Now, if you if you let me share my screen, I'll show you this. And then, obviously, people who are listening to the to the podcast probably aren't going to be able to see this. But no, this yeah, I'm only I'm living in the middle of nowhere, so this will uh, this share my screen. I'm not sure how. So I'm, on, I'm on to share yours. If you, you click have to on request the, it, yeah, if you click on share screen, you could, it'll give you an option and to allow me to. Oh, well, It'll, it'll uh, say host hosts can only share. Maybe it's an advanced. Oh, it's well, I'm on Linux, so it might have like this weird thing where it doesn't do it on Linux. It might be. It's a. I think if you on the bottom of the the bar and zoom, there's a, a share screen button. I think because you're the the host, it'll it'll give you an option there to to take it off. That I should be able to share screen. Oh, multiple participants can share at a time. Okay, I did that. There we go. Now here we go. Now, so I'm going to. Uh, share oh my sweet! Screen. Oh wow! Okay, awesome. So oh you yeah, you need to tra- you need to trademark <laughs> this. By the way, the, every single. It, it literally this needs to be a requirement and even if it was literally you just like went to all like the societies and you gave this to them and then you just started going individually to different medical schools and just pushing this on them no one knows this so, by the way and, and so, this is just kind of generic for us you know working with the is, medication but yeah this is, and this is simple pharmacology unfortunately and so like i said so the daily production of, of a male is somewhere in around five five milligrams per day in a male. So that's what we make naturally. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in young men, that result resolves around like between 600 and 750 nanogram per deciliter. And in older men, it sort of slightly drops off to between 500 and 550. And what ends up happening is there's sort of this loss of circadian release in older men. So we just see this level stay pretty much constant, whereas in Young men, we have a big peak in the morning when we wake up when cortisol is at its highest and it sort of drops off as we go to, to oh, bed. Really? But overall, there's not really a massive variation, to be honest. Like, okay, in a, in a young male, it's gone from 600 to, to 800 in the morning, but within, you know, an hour, you're sort of back down to that baseline of 600. Okay. So there's not, there's not a huge variation. So why would you give injections of testosterone that cause huge variance variances in, in how they how do you and specifically guess. for cream right because cream you're going into like three thousand and then bottoming out at like zero so yeah, like so, the, the cream makes no sense so i mean even here now this is testosterone and anti and obviously like i said the half-life is seven days so let, let's say we administered 300 milligrams per week um now, for anything sort of over 200 milligrams, you yield about 1,300 nanograms per deciliter on average in, in, the, in the normal population. That's neither fast metabolizer or slow metabolizer. But on average, you can sort of see them by like week six, we're sort of falling into this sort of stable-ish level where you're doing one injection a week and you're, you're, you are falling between, you know, 500 and 300 milligrams 
with each injection. But then, like, <laughs> if you give one injection per week, you end up, like we said, you have this huge spike in total testosterone within the first 48 hours, and then it drops off as the ester clears. And we never do this with morphine, right? You're not going to give no. somebody a gram of morphine <laughs> at a time and then the next day give them you know, 50 milligrams, right? It's just not going to happen. And I mean, if you vary that, then I'm going to compare this to how your natural levels work. They don't vary significantly. So, you know, th this doesn't make sense from a from a clinical perspective, any of an ounce of intelligence. And then this is <laughs> this is this is testosterone under decano weight. We're given 200 milligrams every eight weeks where, you know, after the first week, OK, the the undecyclinate, the undecanoid ester enters into your bloodstream after roughly 10 days and you hit 25 nanomolar, which is, I don't know, maybe 700 nanograms per deciliter. And then that slowly drops off. And then you get to like week five, week six, you're down at like 10 nanomolar or, you know, 350 nanogram per deciliter. Ooh, and you, ha you have to ride. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to ride out that trough for another four weeks before you get your magic what? injection to go back to 25 nanomolar. So, this risking is how, heart attacks and strokes, risking heart attacks uh, and strokes, and then uh, raising your DHT and like losing your hair and then like going back down. Yeah. Uh, uh, no. So again, like, so let, imagine we were to do, so again, we, we just pick an average dose, 300 milligrams total per week. If you don't 42.85 milligrams daily, so let's just divide that by seven. By like, say, week four, after week four, your stable, your plasma concentration level stays steady, like perfectly steady. And that's doing everyday injections. Now, some patients don't want to do that, but because it's only 42 milligrams, you know, you're talking maybe 0.2 of a mil injected daily. Mm -hmm. It's not a big injury. You can do it with a sub Q or you could do it with a, a 31 gauge insulin pin. You know, the, sure. the, the injection is probably less likely to be an insult than using a 25 or a 27 G. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm using 25s on a daily basis and I don't really want to, but it's because of my arthritis. So I could try to use like a 31 gauge, but it's just going to be more painful for me to actually, you know, get the Whoosh. injection ready for the, yeah. know, the average person. They're not going to have that, but because of the amount of you know arthritis that I have, it, it kind of sucks. I'm forced to do that, but it's like, ah. Eh, you know, it's it's easier for me, so I just kind of put up with it. Yeah, and then I mean, like with this, then let's say we done a biweekly injection, where you know every three days, every four days. So we're just being a little intelligent here, where we're halving the dosage to match the half life. Mm -hmm. By week five, again, when the stay when the levels are starting to stabilize based on the half life, okay, the level sort of falls between four fifty and three fifty daily based on based on how we're administering the injections, but it's still relatively stable. Versus, you know, giving it once per week we have massive <laughs> elevations and levels. So I love know, using the, 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 the morphine thing because if we use morphine like the most extreme drug a doctor is going to use in most cases, right? And we put them together next to it and just get them to understand that, you know, we're we're a thousand times ahead of everything and it, it really does make a lot of sense to to go down to that kind of level for them to understand it but also the fact that you know even if these new fancier medications these new um what's the embedo stuff whatever that is yeah 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 and what, so what kind of medication is that so nebido is testosterone decanoid it is okay and how so, long does that last for in the body so like eight or nine weeks that's the that's the picture that i showed at the very start of okay. you get your nice injection you hit like 700 nanograms oh okay. and then so an and then over okay. and and over like a six week period you drop off and then you've got like four or five weeks where you're running at 400 wow. nanograms you know it's it, it, i don't know if that's for sale here in the united states but i i can wait like maybe a week from now and then somebody's going to put that out and be like, oh, this is the next best thing. And then all these patients are going to get on it and then feel like crap. And then, oh, well, testosterone doesn't work anymore. And then we'll have to go off to something else. Like, I'm how, expecting how that they, to happen. How do, how do you sell Nibido anyway? Is that, it, you know, it's, oh, you only have to come in and see your endocrinologist or your, your nurse once every three months. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't need to worry about an injection because we'll give you the injection ourselves. You know, th these are the flaws. Uh, 
Thankfully, America's of... too big for something like that, and I think it's one of the reasons why we haven't um, utilized that, even though it's obviously inferior medication, but I'm fairly yeah. certain that because of our population density, that's just not even possible for them to even try to attempt. But I can see them trying to attempt it later, because even we still have these jokers trying to do these pellets, and right, the, the uh, Embido and the pellets are basically the same, right? You're, you're pretty, going pretty from 5,000 uh, total all the way down to like 100, and then, oh, we'll say you're a hyper responder. Now you're at 10,000 wherever you're at. And then, you know, you're, you're, all your symptoms are going off all over the place. And then the doctor just says, oh, well, you just have to wait it out. What do you mean yeah. you have to wait it out? I've got yeah. cystic acne all over my body. My hair is falling out and like literal clumps. Like, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this is, again, where the stigma of these drugs then starts to appear because no one has bothered to appreciate the pharmacology of them. Wow. So, so it's, I, I, it's... one of the last things I want to ask you is, so, you know, I've kind of mentioned this offhand or somewhat before, but in terms of where the levels were at, okay, so, you know, I'm Welsh, you know, you're a, you're a, you know, Irish Celtic guy, we're on an island, we're seafaring people, or the Aryans are coming, now we're fighting them, we're boating to different places, we're going back and forth to America, we're fighting more, <laughs> we're drinking mead, we're doing, you know, straight up tribal stuff. What would have been like a testosterone range that our our ancestors had prior to us? I'd take a guess that at some point in, in history, anyway, our, our test levels from a natural perspective within Europe was probably somewhere in the, the mid 40s. So, so where would that be? Somewhere close to two thousand nanograms, probably f for the US. I've been dare, speculating dare that it's been at the, the technically super physiological levels of whatever is this epidemiological number, but it's a thousand higher. And so, even though the, the kind of people were pushing the levels of say seventy free testosterone is kind of like this crazy bodybuilding or kind of pushing it, I've been kind of speculating that it's roughly around the two thousand to five thousand range. Right that you're up there at a pretty high level way back then of our ancestors. Now, what what I guess people don't appreciate, and I always make people aware of this, what brings the disease when it comes to TRT and obviously anabolics used for bodybuilders is nutrition. So, you know, we live in a heavily processed food society. We have high, highly refined grains. We have high levels of trans fat, saturated fat intake combined with highly insulogenic carbohydrate sources. You know, our ancestors... Like maltodextrin and supplements, right? We never yeah. would have ate maltodextrin ever. And if we yeah. did have something high, high glycemic, it's going to be honey, which I would assume that there's some sort of... If you're digesting it at that huge of a level, when you randomly find it, right, there's an upper limit that your body can process is just going to do it. Whereas like maltodextrin or whatever is just going to consistently dump insulin and glucose into your veins. Yeah, well, I mean, if from looking at an ancestral point of view, you, you then assume that a lot of the sort of hunter-gatherer males were probably at some point heavily glycogen depleted. So in other words, when they came across the source that was rich in carbohydrates, there, there wasn't this instant response where they're falling asleep. They're actually fueling glycogen synthesis to fuel or, or whatever muscle stores that need that glycogen for storage. So your ketones so, can still be high, but then you're still in a glyconated environment, but you still have that kind of counterbalance. Yeah. And I mean, so in other words, you know, if if we were to speculate, because that's sort of what we're doing here from yes, a historical yeah. perspective, if they were to have those super physiological levels of testosterone, their environment wasn't conducive to some of the disease processes that we see developing bodybuilders of late who end up developing heart disease as a result of their anabolic use, primarily because of the environment that, that's being dictated by their nutrition. And so now you have, you know, oxidative stress, you have pollution, and um, we have EMF exposure. You have all these sort of things that drive insults in the body that in a, uh, in a, a simplistic way, drive the oxidation of our LDL particles. 
which then drives arthrosclerosis developments. Yeah. And and obviously in, in times gone by, there wasn't that exposure, to be honest, you know, four or five hundred years ago. And right, you only yeah. had what a couple of months a year to even be able to grow any sort of stuff that you could grow, of plants that could even have a, a glycogen, whatever, but you're not even gonna be able to store that over the winter, right? So you're only gonna even have access to fish. And then I guess whatever cold weather vegetables that you would have, but you wouldn't even be able to store that over the winter. Okay. Yeah. So it's 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 definitely I like like again like I said for the guys that sort of enter into consoles with me, I I always make them wary that you have a duty and responsibility when you go the route of TRT or super physiological usage to pay critical attention to the nutrition that goes into your body. You know, we have we have bodybuilders that are eating like triple cheeseburgers or, you know, going to five guys and getting like a double stack thinking like, oh, you know, this is this is a cheat meal. Whereas to be honest, OK, yes, I'm sure everyone enjoys burgers or have enjoyed a burger at some point in their life. But when you go down this route and you're utilizing this sort of hormone level, you have to be really critical of what happens in your body from the nutrition that goes in, because to be honest, if you had a super physiological level of testosterone and you weren't actively ingesting nutrients that's going to drive arthrosclerosis, how does testosterone drive arthrosclerosis in the absence of nutrition? Oh, I don't know. How does it? That, it doesn't. That's my point that, you know, if you, if you so were... It doesn't have insulin to feed off of and it doesn't have a sugar base. That, uh, other than glycogenesis, uh, maybe through like the over-eating uh, of like protein, uh, right? You wouldn't be able to even do it. Yeah. So in, in other words, if, if you were to take a high dose of testosterone and not eat anything, okay, you would have gluconeogenesis, you'd have muscle protein breakdown to try and fuel your body. You'd have triglyceride release from stored adipose. But overall, once you're sort of at this state where you have no stored adipose or you have, you know, lean muscle mass for gluconeogenesis, do you really think arthrosclerosis is going to develop if you have a really high testosterone level? So it's sort of like... And this yes. is where actually Dr. Ruzzi is like the only guy who's ever mentioned this, by the way. Like, and maybe some fancier researchers or something like that's where he's getting it from. But he's the only guy that's ever put like the two and two together of this. And like yourself, because it's really not talked about. And even like a, a TRT clinic isn't going to know that, which is pretty sad. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the, you know, that's the worry here that, that guys don't understand that the nutrition choices that they take daily uh, really plays a key part in their health for longevity. And so if you're, if you are going the route of TRT, it, it would be wise to, to clear yourself up on, you know, what's the sort of optimized diet? What sort of, you know, what, what should my monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fat intake be? Um, what sort of carbohydrates are best suited for me? In, you know, what, what ends up happening is guys view super physiological levels of androgens as a free pass to be able to ingest whatever they want no 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 <laughs> <laughs> if anything so, right it's it's something that's gonna you need to be more responsible about and uh, they're obviously in two right th th we're also getting off of the fact that we're eating an industrialized diet and we're not going back to what our ancestors ate which for me i know that i'm totally fucked up because you know, I have Sicilian genes and I have Welsh genes and they're not supposed to go together at all. Right. My Italian people, you know, they ate all this pasta and all this stuff and all these just different things that the Welsh didn't eat. And I have all these weird food things that I know are because of that. I'm like, well, why did my dad just find somebody who's Welsh and I don't have to deal with this. and I just eat Welsh food. But obviously I'm in between the two and I can't really deal with doing anything about it, but I can just yeah. try to be careful as I can, but every now and then it catches up with me. I'm like, Oh no, you know, like this is a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, that that's the sort of way that when we then start to look at, like I said, functional medicine and how everything ties together, the, the root causes of disease, you can't just blame it on one thing, to be honest. There's, yeah. there's many, there's many, Keep well, my thing is, like, you know, what came first, the hypogonadism or the TBI, right? Because we were, or the metabolic disease and the hypogonadism, yeah. right? 
you, you really have to play catch up with the both of them. And maybe it's not necessarily just the blanket statement of, oh, go keto, but it's follow your A1C, follow your glucose, figure yep. out what helps and works for you, but also base it off of what your ancestors ate and try to get as close to that as you possibly can. Because if you don't, well, you're really doing yourself a disservice because you're genetically not even adapted to eat that food in the first place. So. Yep, yep. I want to I want to uh, uh, stop it there. I really do, uh, you know, I appreciate your time. I kind of heard the kids, you know, rumbling in the back or whatnot. <laughs> and I, I know that you've had a, already a work day or whatnot. Um, no problem. Wh- what do you want to kind of leave us with as a, a last thing kind of thing? So, so I guess for, for your audience, um, really don't be afraid to push for for clinical diagnosis outside of, of what is being given to you if you're not happy to be honest because you know like you said you you can go from one doctor to the next and the opinions change like flowing water so it's it's very important that if someone has hypogonadal symptoms or has suffered from a tbi or a traumatic incidents that it, it's important like i gave with the anecdote of, of my friend's um scenario that you get treatment fairly quickly in order to lessen the impact overall to your to your future longevity so um by all means don't don't accept um what i'd call education by authority or uh, an authoritative stance on something if if you're not happy at the end of the day the medical profession works for you not the other way around so you really do need to to push for what is going to be the correct diagnosis for you and not do the way around. Dr. Dean, I really do appreciate your time. You're the expert in this. And, you know, I, I wanted to have a conversation with you because, um, you know, I can talk to Dr. Morgenthaler or I can talk to Ruzier, whoever, some of these fancier guys, but you're able to dial this in in a very functional way and you have a gift and every medical school needs to be using your, uh, your diagram that you showed me. <laughs> and, I hope that, uh, you know, you're able to get maybe a contract with like muscle fitness or with ABC or I don't know, somebody big and you can get this out to a broader audience where the uh, actually that Dr. Mike guy, he's getting like millions of views on like his videos and stuff. I'd bug that guy and try to get on his show because um, (laughs) and he's pushing out some craziness. But um, I I think that your powers combined with him and and his ability to get things out to a, a broader population would really help. And uh, you've got a lot of work ahead of you because I'm telling you, <laughs> like these guys, like on these forums, are more educated than the doctors, and that's a problem. Like we, it is. we really have to solve that. It is, and that's sort of where I, I I took a step away from forums because there, there came a point also where you're you're trying to speak scientific sense. And it's just not getting anywhere. And it's sort of like, okay, yeah, I, I need to figure out a different way of doing this without the noise of, of trying to be overheard. And and that's sort of where I, I moved away from online forums and don't don't really entertain myself by looking at them anymore. But you can be sure in yeah, my early... Do you have your own uh, YouTube channel or whatnot? So the, the best place to, to follow me is, is Instagram. Okay. So my Instagram is D-E-A-N-S-T-M. That sort of, if you go there, there's a lot of like highlights on different scenarios surrounding, you know, hypogonadism, just oh, wow. like blur- blurbs from over the years of, of me, you know, basically trying to educate more so for anabolics users. Sure. And then obviously the anabolics education falls over to TRT. Yeah. And um, you have your own supplement company also, correct? I, I, I'm so I'm the formulator for a UK supplement company called Supplement Needs. Um, so that sort of came about from my love of functional medicine and trying to create products that helped people who use androgens to support their health in a meaningful way, provided they understand how the compounds cause disease. Oh, wow. So and you guys so, sell you know, that stuff in the United States too? Can I buy it and you ship yeah, it over here? Yes, yes, yes. Lee, 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 Lee ships to the US. Now we don't have a distributor, so that the shipping probably will cost maybe $20, but he definitely oh, wow. does ship. But but the, the products themselves, like I created a liver stack, a oh, kidney wow. okay. stack, yeah. a, a heart stack. Like I made products that are clinically dosed with um, 
natural supplements that address some of the disease processes of of anabolic use or even TRT, testosterone. Well, now that we're talking about the whole TBI thing, you have to start looking into that and do your own uh, thing. Because this, so this hyperzine stuff and like these other ancillary things, like it's honestly difficult for people to research, let alone what the actual dosages that you need. And then because there's these higher dosages, you're having to do it. And like, you can't find like one thing that's going to be all stacked together. You have to like yeah. combine it and like make your own potion and like it's rough. Yeah, and that, that's sort of where like when, when I teamed up with, with Lee of Supplement Needs, I, I said to him, let's create a brand where you can go and do exactly what you said there, buy products that are stacked with ingredients that are beneficial to people's health rather than going to this retailer. And, you know, from my past experience was because this was me personally, I'd be buying some health supplements and I'd be going to Amazon and I'd be going yeah. to iHerb and I'd be going to this sort of online retailer. And it's just becoming a pain trying to order. Well, like berberine, right? Berberine in, in like compounded uh, with the other stuff, it's never at the level that you need it. So I have to buy exactly. it on its own. I have to take like three of them at a time just to get the amount that I need. And, and it's rough. So that that's sort of where I, again, all this, like what we said to start, like I'm, I'm a chemical engineer by, by career. And then all this sort of endocrinology, pharmacology is a, a hobby you could say like it's it's a it's a passion that and you should I'm keep not, it that way right that's i'm you know, glad that's that a, you have a regular that, job and you that, can do that that's that that's that's how i view this is that it's it's a it is exactly a hobby it's it's a passion of mine to educate and do this sort of a, as something on the side because someone once said to me oh do you not go down the route of this being your career of you know getting into proper you know pharmacology and endocrinology consultation and i was like well if you're doing this every single day as a job, interacting with, you know, everyone day in, day out, eventually you come to a point where you won't view it as fun as what it is now. Yeah. <laughs> where where I, I, I'm not reliant on this to be my career, but it still drives me to try and excel at being a, a top level educator on yeah. this, this field that, you know, it sort of drives you then that. I'm I'm not relying on trying to coax people into being a client or <laughs> trying to drive sales. It's literally like, here's yeah. information. If you want to take it on board, great. And if not, you can choose to ignore it. But you know, I, I like my Instagram is filled with like highlights from years gone by of just sharing silly little things. Oh wow! That I have I haven't checked. I'm honestly not even on Instagram, so I have to check it out. I mean, I'm 30. I just turned 36. Me and Instagram don't exactly go well together, but <laughs> I'm going to check it. Obviously, if a lot of people's on there, you know, and, and Facebook's really just only way to message people and whatnot. And then, yeah, and then I, Fed I, post I, about our, our, uh, our ridiculousness of, uh, of the world that we live in and, I, I know, don't, and share, uh, <laughs> toxic memes and that sort of thing. I, I slowly moved away from Facebook. My, my Facebook is very barren. I, yeah. I, I would have I would have used it years ago, but again, like you said, it's it's just a messaging service, yeah. and uh, for for people that want to follow me, you're better off follow me on Instagram. And if you need to message me on Instagram, do it that way because normally normally my Facebook is is not not personal, but I don't really check it. So yeah. people people can message me on Instagram, and I won't see it unless I'm I'm going in and actively looking. Awesome. Um, I don't want to take more of your time. You know, we, we spent a lot of time already. You know, you got the whole family and the kids thing and you, you had a whole job that you already did. So I really do appreciate your time. Um, I hope in, you know, maybe a month or two or so we could get on this again and, and, uh, you know, maybe talk about, you know, some other types of topics or whatnot, um, kind of, you know, in this same realm, um, and kind of pick your brain about some other things. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to be a pleasure, Brad. Awesome, Dr. Dean. I really appreciate it. And sometime you have to come to West Virginia and you can try some bourbon and some good uh, barbecue out here. Uh, I would love to. I would definitely <laughs> love to. Awesome, sir. I'll talk to you later. All right. Speak to you soon, Brett. Thank you. Bye. Bye.